segue now into uh, uh, Viktor Antonov. And, um, and uh, just move straight into uh, this, this presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, Viktor has been, uh, he's worked on a variety of projects, uh, most famously, and uh, as we've mentioned, is uh, doing uh, art and production design for both Half-Life 2, the game, and uh, for even in cinema, including the, the recent film, uh, Christian Volkman's film, uh, Renaissance, set in uh, imaginary Paris of the year 2054. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Victor Antonov. Thanks. Thank you. Can I get this pointer? Went through a variety of different jobs in the last 15 years, and um, I started as a car designer. I used to do concept design for um, futuristic cars. Um, then most of them sort of seemed out of context and ridiculous because they didn't match the environment, so I decided to become an environment artist to be able to put non-existing cars in them, and that led me to video games. One, one thing that was interesting about video games and why I got into it is because in video games you can't choose your focal length and zoom in. Everything is majestic and, and grand because you have a 80 degree open screen and I really like epic, grand, big images. So what I was doing, I was a concept designer and art director for um, traditional science fiction stuff. Today I'll talk to you about a new project I'm, I'm working on, which is a French animated feature, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. So I'm just gonna browse through a couple of images of what I used to do before. These are the kind of things, monumental, big architectural things. Um, in concept design, usually you want people to believe the thing you're showing them in the place you're putting them into because if they don't believe it they would just not be interested and the the monster that's going to jump out or the the fight scene that's going to occur won't matter so that's why i want to do sort of monumental big architecture i want to keep the lighting really simple and the color palette really simple and not have any shiny textures and uh, i have a very minimal philosophy and i'm talking about science fiction and fiction in general um i think I think I would define what I really like in, in fiction is uh, what E.T. Hoffman does. Uh, Hoffman, the German romantic writer, because he's the guy who invented um, fantastic realism. See, before Hoffman in the 18th century, there was the Black Forest in Germany and everything was fantastic in the Black Forest. And then there was city life. And Hoffman, with, um, you know, who know the, wrote The Nutcracker, was the first one to mix in the, the monsters from the forest into a clerk's life, which led later to Kafka and to this whole generation, leading to Garcia Marquez talking about literature, which is fantastic realism. And um, that's why I don't like pure science fiction, because it sets you in a world that it's a whole s different set of rules. So I'm always trying to go for something realistic um, and then try to sucker punch the viewer or the, or the reader with the surprise of the, this magical element that's gonna come. Um, so these are still, this is um, an illustrated book that I'm doing right now, uh, which is about utopian architecture it happens to be, and this is a suspended city that's hanging on cables. Another note that it's gonna lead to what I'll show you later is that I like to change styles with every project I'm doing. So basically I draw, um, I'm, I'm modeling, I got into writing a little bit just for to see what happens. And now we'll, um, we'll go to a very exciting new project that happened in France. It's a feature film, a science fiction uh, feature film called The Prodigies. Well, uh, this is a story of five kids that are geniuses and they get aggressed in New York. They get hurt and they have very small superpowers. When they're together, they can control people's minds and body. So it turns into a revenge movie and it's, it's a subtle level of science fiction. Another context note on this is that there's a, a telecommunications company, Orange, in France, like telecom, that are very rich and they open the movie studio. So it's a very, and they, they uh, bought the rights to the book. So it's a co-production between three companies. And they had this, the rights of a, a science fiction novel from a guy called Bertrand Lanteric, who wrote La Nuit des Enfants Rois, which is, you know, the night of the child kings. It's an 80s bestseller in France. Now, they had the, right, the rights for this book, and they couldn't do it in life because it's very violent, and that there's even a, a 
minor rape scene in it. So somebody had the idea, let's do it in animation. And then for, um, for a long, long time, they couldn't figure out what to do with it and uh, how, to, how to turn this into an animation feature because they couldn't find the style or the visual representation of it. Because either some artists would suggest let's do it the Mizayaki way or the Pixar way. So before I talk about architecture, light, and structures, I'd like to just talk about perceptions and rendering styles. And if you have a cube or a sphere or anything at all, it's very important how you show it. And that leads to subjective perceptions. My main themes so they are going to be making up sci-fi cities, basically. Um, and I have, you know, a, you know, the metropolis kind of theme, which for a video game, for a film, if it's science fiction, the first question is where, where are we going to put this? Where is it taking place? And is it real or sci-fi? So we'll, we'll go through all these things. Um, when it comes to science fiction cities, I'm going to avoid the word metropolis, but it, it's a nice sport designing these big, majestic cities that we don't get to design very much lately. Um, and I just say the fantastic capital. Why? Because they're a reflection of big, big world capitals, usually these cities that, that, that play a major role. It's always New York or Paris or uh, Los Angeles. So um, today I'll show you a couple of video games, that a video game and a movie with two alternative Paris and one New York and one colonial city. And the, the capital, I, I think it's fantastical because all capitals are a collective fantasy of the country or the empire that the capital is, is ahead of. And it's this projection of everybody's fantasies about happiness and, and exposure and stimulus. So it's all the, the capital has always been an utopia as opposed to the other utopia that's the colonial utopia, when you go far away to reach another place that's better than where you live. So I have these two main themes about you know, designing sci-fi cities. Now, uh, this is just a photo of, of Paris, and I'll talk about how a city by itself is a fiction without any design because it has all these al all alternate realities to it just by the, the rule of perception. Um, I'm just going to go very quickly to Hugh Ferris and, and you know, the, the fantasies about the, the futuristic city. That was a, a musical, 1930s American musical comedy, and I forgot the name of it. I think it's What If, or If Suppose, or something like this. And uh, this story of the, of the prodigy is taking place in New York, actually. So a decision we took with the director is to play down the sci-fi element, because it was an interesting idea that I got from a, a Polanski movie, um, uh, The um, Repulsion, where a girl gets crazy, and the crazier she gets, he changes her apartment every time, with every stage of her madness. You never realize this. It's just that her perceptions are you know, modified in three-dimensional way. Well, I said, what if in this film here, that's what I proposed, the architecture doesn't change, Nothing much changes. It's a pretty realistic New York, but only the rendering style changes. So before we get to architecture, I just want to talk about perception, and, and that that's a something that's very important, how a drawing or, or a painting is, uh, or a, a three-dimensional object is represented. So we started with the idea, let's do it painterly style. So this is sort of a, the, some of the first concept art. And what you'll see today is not images from the movies or the video games, but always from the pre-productions, because that's very exciting moments of, um, of uh, when, you, when you draw out everything and, you, and there's no technical restraints. So the Prodigy takes place in New York. Uh, there's certain style of lighting that needed to be established because, uh, you know, we decided not to change the buildings and not to use a goddamn city like New York, not a fantastical New York, but you have just two tools to make it fantastical, three, let's say, rendering and light. Uh, well, the, they are two tools. And with every emotion and with every character, we would change the rendering of the same object a little bit. And this is in production. It will come out next year and we'll, we'll see the result. Uh, so this is a much more monumental image of New York. This one is much more painterly. Well, these are tools of, of communicating something about the subject that we very rarely use in film. Film focuses mostly on explosion, action of film and blockbusters, on fires and action. But we never 
change the language and the tonality of the language. How do we talk about the subject matter? Well, imagine you're a cop or you're in your 40s or you're a kid or a teenager, you see the world differently. So this is sort of the concept of the prodigies where there's a different rendering style, harsher, more monumental style, and softer painterly style. And, uh, and what if in a film, according to the character perceptions, the image changes? So the subject matter in this case doesn't matter. It could be the same cube, the same building, the same car, no matter what. This is the first drawing of the film because I wanted the artists who were going to create this non-existing New York to bring out the, 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 the trashy aspect of New York because very often in science fiction it's the monumental goddamn city. So we took a decision never to show the upper floors of the building. And New York actually is full of junk as you've probably seen. There's always scaffoldings and constructions and signage and um, everything is being rebuilt constantly. So that's a good theme right there to, to talk about a subjective perception of the same city. Because New York's been filmed so many times, it's been painted, it's been lived differently. So in this film, The Prodigies, we're going to um, just re be really specific of what we show and not what, the, what it, it looks like. Another idea about New York is how about if we create a New York that never, um, that never shows any of the monuments? Because very often what you saw, what you see in, in, in science fiction, you see the Chrysler building, the Eiffel Tower. Well, this was a decision here to make sort of a, a copy of New York that <coughs> there's not a single street that's correct geographically, not a single building, but just the rhythms and the themes are there. So this is a, an interesting approach, I think, to, to how to represent a city when you don't give any exact clue, because that's what cities are like very often. This, is, um, this was one of the first drawings um, also to establish the rendering style. So this is sort of a painterly style in the sense that anything that's smaller than, than five centimeters we don't show. Things are pretty loose. And it's also not very aesthetic because in animation you have the genre. It's, if it's Japanese or American style animation, you have this very, very wide matte painting with a lot of detail in the background. So for the prodigies, we have this interesting approach to not show a lot of detail, not go for aesthetics, and be very, very sober. So that's why we come again to rendering. And the architecture has been dealing with rendering a lot because since the 19th century, there were these beautiful washes that I'll come later to, then it turned into uh, marker drawings, then it went to, to 3D rendering. And I think that's a very crucial point of how you communicate your idea and uh, choosing a different style of rendering and for animation film. So I decided let's even go sloppier with the rendering and see if we can go really rough with this idea that we can vary the level of, of detail and the level of what you see. And rather than blurring things out of focus, just reducing level of detail. So we're trying to get shots of the movie to look actually like this. This is an Irish cop's kitchen and it gets really, you know, everything is sort of messy. And uh, this is very, very simple lighting. So <coughs> this here I'm describing a fictional New York that doesn't exist. There's not a single street that looks like New York but we're getting just to what is the essence of a city. It's a certain lighting style, it's a certain theme of trash, of garbage, uh, certain overall themes and sensations that you get when you get out of the airport. So I think this is a, a totally the opposite approach of making the majestic sci-fi city, which I'll get to later, <coughs> about how to, um, how to capture the, really the spirit of a city or of a town without design or without architecture before getting to the architectural level because there, there are all these things that are really important and it's light and texture and level of detail and rhythms and themes that are completely abstract. Animation film um, <coughs> is very good because it could get us back to the, the golden age of cinema because we control all the parameters sort of like in a US studios where everything was fake. That's why animation is good. The problem with animation is that it has genre. It's a family film entertainment and it's 3D and it has these specific looks. So I think that's what's important in this film, The Prodigies, that we're making now, that I'm a, I'm a production designer for, that um, to, to change the rules and get to perceive a city and get out of the genre of animation and just make a regular film, very simplistic, and create a fake naturalism. Are we gonna big build this city, have different long focal lengths and, and show things in a very messy, sloppy way without looking for aesthetics, and this is just to get back to my theme is before we, I, I'll talk the actual architecture building of the cities is how do we render them, how do we communicate about our drawings and about the object that we create. Do I show everything? <coughs> In animation traditionally, um, people 
are really, really crazy about antennas, brick textures, because we can make them in 3D. And uh, that's, a, that's a big danger. So a decision that was made here is to step back, remove all textures, all details, all wires, and just stick to light, like I mentioned before. That's your main tool, light and mass. So this is a night scene here. And I'm just going through the logic of our pre-production so you can get a glimpse of, of how this movie is getting developed without the design part, but just, um, so see the, all these things are just blocks. There's no small details, no bricks, and the light source you can imagine is just the street. So we have just one single light source, <coughs> again, very simple. It's a street light, the light shoots up in the sky and lights the sky and then bounces back and you have a subtle <coughs> ambient all over the city. And that's it. Uh, very often when we light non-existing cities, we get carried away with putting all these little lights everywhere and this could give us the, the, the Harry Potter effect when you have a black background and the problem with this is you have all these spots of light everywhere and it looks very often like a Christmas tree and there's no hierarchy to the rid of it and you don't know where to look. So the idea here was to simplify, simplify and stylize. And that goes with a, with a belief that I have that there's no realism. You can take any city and if you try to go for realism, you're gonna fail because again, subjective perceptions Whoever's going to see the city is going to see it in a different way, and you have the right to cheat and tweak and simplify. And I think part of fi what fiction is really good for, because it eliminates everything that's not essential, just like in photography. And I think that's, this is a desired rule I'm following. Rather than trying to describe things carefully, just put the straight, the minimum amount of information, because in a good photo, you don't see parasite things that appear. It's pure and minimal. So the exercise of, of doing this film <coughs> is just to reduce the level of information to a strict, strict minimum. Hope that doesn't fly again. And, um, <coughs> and see what is really, really essential for the viewer. And that's this distilled version of reality that, <coughs> that is very essential in, in design and architecture too, but also in communicating what is designed. So if you make something amazing, how do you, how do you communicate about it? How do you talk about it? And it could be visual communication, which is very simplistic here. And it gives also, this, this, this is not a real New York scene, it sort of gets the overall impression of New York, which I think is more important. Uh, this is just uh, another illustration that I did that combines a lighting style that's pretty harsh and realistic, the silhouettes and the lit. But if you analyze any of this, it's just big masses. And there's nothing except for the signage, which is the main theme, that there's a lot of garbage and orange plastic in New York, and these are these vivid spots. Uh, that Mr. Cook spoke about the the weird non-aesthetic things in a city, which are very important element. So I have this, this really almost romantic right hand of a painting, which looks like a 40s New York representation and a hopper, you know, who's one of the guys who represented New York magnificently. And then this ugly neon trash and garbage and, and cigarette and, and, and an a lot of signage. So this is just a, another exercise of how to represent a city and because we have so much science fiction already in everything we see that it's what, what, how do I tune it if it was music? What's the most important melody that I'm gonna play? So here the choices were masses and plastic garbage, for example, and that, that sort of signifies the city. Going further into purity, and when you eventually see that film, it's a Warner distributed film. Um, the chair there on the right side well, this was about the strict minimum amount of information that we can give about a chair. There's just a highlight, a shadow, and a, and a bit of bounced light that hits it from the bottom. I think there's too much light here to see that correctly. But um, this is about just being sober in communicating about something. And if we can pull this rendering off, nobody's going to realize that it's this special kind of rendering. So we're pushing this to be the most minimal animated film ever done with realistic light, real volume, real shapes only the amount of information is reduced to a strict minimum. And then you don't need really um, science fiction. Another point is light again, and light is very related to architecture, of course, because every, you don't see anything without light. And, and it just, the decision in this film is to light every scene with one single light source, which is, um, you know, very horrible for some 3D lighters who love to use all their capacities and put all these lights everywhere and everything will become really, really, um, uh, complicated and this is just let's make a, a pretty harsh and non-aesthetic 3D film and the rule I, I wanted to, to apply is just one light source one one sun per window and you stop there and let's see what happens and it's about again rendering and how much information do I give 
Now, decided to get further with this film, just without the architecture. What if when things are, when, you, when, when there's anxiety, emotions, will you see less things? When you're very stressed out and there's a cab honking on the street, you only hear the cab or you see one face. Well, when we're gonna have high emotions here without turning the movie in a, into an artistic movie, we're gonna reduce the level of detail by, by half. And then we're just gonna leave little details that are important to the story. And this, I think, is in, in, in another you know, very important thing that we forget in design and, um, and uh, communication when we render and show our project is like, what do I communicate and what's the hierarchy? Where do I look first? Because sometimes the object behind the drawing is so important to us that we, we don't know how to talk about it. So in this film, hopefully, we'll manage to create this completely switch from a realistic painterly style to a very impressionist painterly style when in moments of high emotion, anguish, things are gonna go abstract. And, and we're gonna keep losing detail and losing detail and which will amount to a blur. And this could work even for a close-up. You see this girl here, um, and I, I hired only, um, I made a team of painters only, traditional painters to do the pre-production of this because they have the simplicity and the directness of communication of, um, and, uh, of, of how to tell a story with three brush strokes and uh, about minimal communication. And this is just, you know, two tones uh, flat and we lose all color nuances and we lose, we become very minimal. We don't get use blurs or lens flares and you can read the scene. Things start melting and we know now that just by visual communication, not by the subject matter, things change and dissolve. And, uh, and that's high intensity. There, we can even start having splashes of movement. So these are, these are things we're reproducing in animation right now. Although that's not really a, you know, an architecture subject, but this is a, a very important matter to me nowadays is after going through designing a lot of different things and represent them realistically, well, how can you take something very simple and represent it in different ways and then you go to the, to the subjective reality things and sometimes you don't look you don't need to look very far in science fiction because you can just determine every, about every every piece of reality in something surreal. There's a Lynch feeling to the painter who did this. This is a, a one of the artists. So it is this just little touches of color and oversimplification. And the rule always was the light should be correct and should bounce correctly. Uh, that's that's the same girl's room that, that went into red. And, and then in this film, this is a Whistler painting. The idea was that there'll be a third level of rendering, but they all smoothly blend with each other. And this third level is when there's violence. And uh, in the very violent moments, the, the, the city will disappear altogether. As a national Wu comic book here, where when there's extreme violence, you don't, you don't pay attention to the architecture around. You don't pay attention about anything. You're, you're just really scared and that's such an adrenaline level. So in this film, we're gonna remove environments and remove the city altogether when there's high peaks of violence and you're just gonna see blurs and movements and faces and fists and things like this. So, um, and what I'll show you now before moving on is um, just some actual shots of the film that we're um, painting as color boards. Um, so this is uh, actual shots that are gonna be very close to what will be in the film. And just to see, this is the challenge question. Really, how little can I communicate about a city or a piece of design? If you look at the background, this becomes completely abstract. I don't think it, I don't think it, it, needs, the, it needs more information. The fact that we see a couple of indications that we're in Times Square and the car is sort of realistic is about enough. And this thing back there is really, what is it, cubism, a bunch of stains and uh, the, the there's a real, you know, feel of, of I don't know, people, are, 3D artists are scared to do this because it's like, what are people gonna see? That's a crappy model. Well, that doesn't matter. It's again, context and, and level of information. So these are really rough sketches, just trying to push things to how far can we go in minimal representation and just put the information where we need it, which is a big problem in sci-fi even when you think of big spaceships or aliens and things like this, they all cover with detail and they all shine and they all have these spikes and spokes and buttons and sometimes you don't get to the essential. And I'm just, th this is an approach to science fiction about how, about becoming very minimal and very abstract and just pulling little things where they need to, to exist. And uh, again, just talking about a world and a street without showing what's on the street, just with reflections on the hood, should be able to do the job. 
you suggest by just, so in this scene, we're gonna try to have the car move and have all these crazy reflections floating all over the place and we'll know about the fact that we're in, we're in a certain ambience in a New York or, or Bronx Street uh, or Brooklyn Street, I'm sorry, just about the reflections and the image could be as trashy as it wants to be. And, and an even further, just, just harsh. Um, and these are very small, these are like three centimeter little sketches and, and that's why they, they look extremely rough when they're big, but this is the point, to, to just to measure and see how far can you go in, in communicating in a very minimal way. And then, you know, uh, this was, um, yeah, this was the, my little blimps that I show you of the pre-production of the prodigies which would be out next um, next year and now we're turning this into 3D. Now I'm going to skip back to much more traditional stuff, which is how do we make science, science fiction cities? Basically, uh, in a pre-production for a video game or a film, you get a group of marketing people, you get the CEO, you get the artist, and you have three weeks to make up your mind. Well, we're gonna go to London or to New York and we're gonna make it medieval or futuristic. These are hard decisions. And um, I'll just try to have some fun now of show you of what the what if scenario. So I'll walk you through another pre-production of a <coughs> video game where we're making a parallel Paris. Now, this is a cool example of what the what if scenario. If Stalin was alive 10 years later than, you know, he's dead, this would, what, uh, this would be in Moscow. That's a real drawing of a, of a Russian architect. And it's really funny because it's gigantic, it's humongous. So that's the classical sci-fi exercise. What if something changes at one point of history and that leads to science fiction cities, you know, and to utopias. So I think dictatorships are the best at making utopias uh, normally. And I'm just showing different drawings. This was a big project in Moscow. You can see the Kremlin with the star just dwarf next to this big thing and there's this gigantic Lenin. I think this is fantastic exercise of utopia and, and, and crazy, uh, crazy, completely surreal architecture. And of course, they, they made sure to, um, to be out there. They didn't put the pyramids, but it's taller than the Eiffel Tower, this project. And it was a real project that existed in, in Russia. It was tall, taller than the Chrysler building. So this is usually um, the premise of what if something changes in history and, and how do you get to a, to a utopic city? Um, so I'll, I'll show you a little part of how we went about designing a parallel Paris. Now, um, I made um, the team build this in 3D, and this is just a regular Parisian facade. And this is still in the, the realm of capitals and how do we make fantastic metropolises and, and what do we do there? How do we change? So I spoke about rendering and perception, now we're getting to pure architectural interpretation. Very often people get sloppy when they design sci-fi because they stretch the buildings and it stops there. So we try to do something more interesting here. Um, try to analyze what's, in, what's specific about Paris opposite another city. And the, the, the first floor has the, the tallest actually ceilings as opposed to the American penthouse perception when the richest people live on the top, the richest people in Paris live on the bottom because they enjoy the spectacle of the street. So this is a very realistic representation of a Haussmann kind of a boulevard. Now, what do you do with it to, to turn, and we decided to have a neo-Gothic Paris and it's changed 300 years ago. A difficult one to pull off, but still recognizable as Paris. Well, you we went to this theme, and these are really rough sketches. What if you take the first floors and you say, I'm gonna stretch them and pull this theme to an extreme and make them outrageously luxurious. And then the higher up you go, which is the opposite of the architectural logic that we know. The things get, the apartments get crappier and then you have the maid rooms and then you, the, and then you have the, the really, really tiny, and the, actually the ghetto is on the, on the top floor, not on the bottom floor, as we have it usually and logically. And then another theme is when, I'm gonna go back really quickly, all these smokestacks in Paris are very repetitive and very noticeable because they stand out and they're like silhouettes. Well, let's stretch the smokestacks and let's say it's a, if this happened before the Renaissance, let's change things there. And there was no, um, there was no Renaissance and Gothic went straight through without going to neoclassicism. So we're eliminating neoclassicism. We're keeping the limestone of Paris and we're getting two themes that are the tall bottom floors and the, the smokestacks and we stretch them. So there's a design parameter here to do a, a specific sci-fi city, which is a parallel Paris. Let's go even crazier and put the, the, the pulleys and the cars with the smokestacks and create a whole forest of things going on there. 
which will suggest then for Zigdot to give out information what happening to the city. And then this is putting color. So with very simple things, just one, two things are changing. You can start to achieve very, very, um, very spectacular results and maybe then you can tune it down. Did I go too far or not? So there's a whole theme of, uh, of smokestacks turned into monuments and uh, religious <coughs> monuments and a whole ghetto upstairs and, and every neoclassical detail in Paris is removed and it's just gothic stuff. Uh, and these are some sketches of just taking things to the extreme and what can we do with a parallel Paris. Uh, and it's just about analyzing what, and I, I have done two par Paris projects because we've seen a lot of New Yorks and a lot of Los Angeles and Paris is such a <coughs> fantastical city and of course is London and very few exercises have been done on how to, how to turn Paris into a, into a science fiction city and how to do a parallel Paris. So this was this whole exercise here is to take some major themes of, of what's the essence of Paris, keep it and then um, then, okay, so there we go in 3D now. We take these themes and we start getting them more sober, in a very sober way. First floors go higher, we stretch the buildings a little bit and we have this drastic reduction of, of quality as you go upstairs. And, uh, and then you can have this, this building block of set of buildings that are, that are really fun all of a sudden because you have a, 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 a strong theme that's no classicism, only Gothic architecture, you have things getting reduced to the top and you, you change the scale and proportions. Uh, that's, that's the first uh, bridge I showed you. Then, you know, this is Pont Neuf in a neo-Gothic fashion that stretched vertically and neoclassical elements were replaced with Gothic elements and then you have the smokestacks. And this is a, a rendering that's been pushed further just with these simple things. When you start to get a realistic feeling of, of what Paris could look like if it was like this. But in order to make this function, this time the narration, the lighting is very, very simple. <coughs> so every fanciness about lighting has been eliminated and this is totally the opposite of what I spoke before. This is just architectural stylization leading to science fiction. And the opposite before was no architectural changes at all, just perception and rendering. And that's another you know, higher up shot of a, of a parallel Paris. And sometimes it's much simpler to do science fiction than we think because you just change one parameter of one thing in the city and you keep everything the same. And what's the most important thing about Paris really? That it has no color. And everything is made out of limestone because it's the most conservative city on earth. Uh, since, the, since the Renaissance again, they decide to be the new Rome, to be more classical than the classicals. So there were such rules and regulations that you can't build a house different than your neighbor's house. So Paris is this monolith of a city. And you apply these to the houses and you make them all the same color and now it's all sandblasted <coughs> and it sort of looks the same and you stretch it and, you, and then you have sort of a, a parallel Paris. So this is for, the, for a video game um, called The Crossing. So the point is when you have this big city, a big metropolis and you want to make a science fiction version of it but it's still believable and how do you, how do you approach this? How do you go about it? Um, this is a little glimpse of this game, um, Half-Life 2. It was came out in 2005, and I'm, I'm not going to spend much time about on it because it's it's old. But um, this is a third a third kind of exercise of of science fiction cities. Well, this is into the future. What that means is this: the point of change in history didn't happen back in past in the past in time, but it happened in the future. So um, I wanted for this science fiction city to build an Eastern European city because they're funny because they're, they're a product of science fiction Eastern European cities because they took from Russia, from Turkey, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So we took a lot of care of building a layer of 19th century Eastern Europe. Then we added a layer of 70s Eastern Europe, 80s Eastern Europe. Uh, the, the Nazis were there at one point, the Russians. So we spent time to build all these different layers and mix them proportionally. And then, of course, the alien layer comes on the top of all this as the ultimate di dictatorship invader. I think this, this is why the, 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 the city was uh, still believable with this gigantic citadel and this wall that crawls and, ev and eats everything because uh, the buildings were realistic down to the smallest detail. You know, the fact that it was plaster, brick, rather than just some generic 3D material. So it was a huge investment in research of how these things are actually built and made. So this is a concept of, uh, of Half-Life 2 city, which is invaded for the 20th time already. 
like I mentioned, Turks been there, Austro-Hungarians, Russians, and now aliens. So um, this is <laughs> basically the, the ultimate dystopia for, of, of Eastern Europe. And this is just a, a simpler exercise where you layer history and you keep on anticipating the next layer that's gonna happen to, to this city. And um, the movie Renaissance, which was a, a daring, challenging film, in the sense that the producers decided to make it in black and white only with no colors at all. The themes here are mixed, I have to admit. Uh, the movie was successful in many ways visually, and it, it's sort of a, a little cult movie. It had a crappy script, crappy scenario, horrible story, and dialogues, which, uh, which ruined it, and it was badly distributed. But, you know, <laughs> no, it's true, it's true. It, it, it ruined an Irish bank, this movie. That's for some reason, I don't know how production works, but after the movie flopped, an Irish bank closed. That, that, was, that was a link to this. <laughs> so there's, this is the mysteries of production. So I'll, I'll show you some of the pre-production of uh, Renaissance, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm attached to this movie because it has a, a lot of beautiful things about it. And this is sort of a bastard approach to science fiction where you're gonna change Paris, and you're gonna take some from Blade Runner and some of your favorite films from here and there and some futuristic stuff, and there's nothing wrong with this. And, um, and these are just some, you know, really rough sketches looking for themes. And one theme was that something grew bigger than the Eiffel Tower at one point and went through all of the buildings. And you don't know what it is. So you have just have this context of iron things piercing the city the whole time. And we have the bridges replaced with glass. Uh, so a mixture of materials. And we have these, it goes all over the place. And it's just pure, sheer science fiction fun where all, everything's allowed just to create a cool, cool metropolis out of, out of a city. This was done in, in 2000. I think these things are starting to exist or they, they have a hotel like this. Probably they were in the works already architecturally. Modules that go on rooftops. Uh, is this the time? Okay, that's perfect. So I'm gonna go just to the second, to the second uh, kind of city because I'm, I'm doing this little illustrated novel uh, on, you, on uh, colonial colonies in Utopia. And they're totally opposite of the big metropolis. Uh, colonies are, are a thing of the 19th century and then, uh, and then of science fiction because they become the stars and the moon. And I just wanted to get back to the 19th century and remind people uh, in the sense that other than steampunk, there was a lot of constructions and coloni con colonialism. And uh, uh, this is a, a pencil ad from, I don't know what era exactly, but this is uh, an example of what colonies represented for humanity. This was the original colony which there was a lot of gold and coolness out there and then something bad would eventually happen. And this was the Orientalists. That's how they imagined uh, this magical fictional big city of the Orient, which blended Cairo and, and Istanbul and all these different cities and there was always sexuality to it and all the fun and beautiful colors. And uh, this is important because between the capital and the colony, there's always this road of, of eventually deception and dystopia that occurs. That's another, Jerome, who's a very good Orientalist painting. And then uh, this is another type of colonialism. This Baroque wanted to import complete order into colonies from the, from the time of the, uh, the conquistadors already and then in through neoclassical cities. So this is a drawing of a, of a city, neoclassical city for a colonial settlement somewhere and it looks like a, a computer chip. So I think this is it's really interesting about colonialism and this I'm gonna quickly browse through a couple of drawings which I'm using again this style change in my illustrated book where the, the level, the book starts like a, an architectural drawing and the further the character who's gonna go after this colonial utopia, it's a city suspended on cables that's to be built over the colony and he's a young architect who designed it. And the further he goes into his um, sort of um, heart of darkness trip and he goes to the colony and the rendering is gonna become more and more realistic. So this is just playing with, with representations here. Here he gets hurt once he's in the colony. And then uh, at certain illustrations will be like this when he gets to see the city and from a drawing that he's, that he's seen and drawn and he, the whole world seems to seem like an architectural drawing because he's so fixated about his drawings. And once he gets into his complete fantasy, things come to life and become real. So these are ideas from transitions of rendering when you're trying to communicate something. Uh, just zooms in this, again, megalomanical um, colonial construction that's hanging on cables above a colony and what could take place on it eventually. Uh, and what if you change the feel of it and just the atmosphere once you're there and it's not so happy uh, and utopistic anymore. And I'll just complete with just this storyboard of all kinds of things that are gonna happen to this character. So thank you for, for your time.
Thanks, Victor. Um, we, we have time again for another uh, short q and I think we'll do for maybe just five minutes or so of questions before breaking for uh, lunch. And um, uh, originally we were going to uh, put Peter and, and Victor together, but uh, because Peter took off, uh, I think we're going to do uh, Jim, Ross, and y'all, myself, Victor, and maybe Liam doing some moderation. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, we can, and, and then I'll say, yeah, if there are questions from the audience, uh, I believe there'll be a, a second microphone traveling around. What's that? Sure, yeah, well, yeah, we can colonize the table here. Should I? If that works. <laughs> Um, just, just kind of an observation. Uh, one of the things that uh, your per talk reminded me of was uh, there's a graphic, or not a graphic designer, there's a concept artist in uh, Los Angeles named uh, Mark Gurner. And um, he had been, uh, basically give, he gave himself a design uh, challenge, which was to say, what would the Roman Empire look like if the Romans had had structural steel? And uh, he proceeded to, to use that sort of, um, you know, you had said if you take one element and kind of isolate that and turn that into uh, kind of a, this almost like mutational moment from which to e extrapolate a new city, you know, yeah, what, what I in this case, if you can give structural steel to the ancient Romans, you know, yeah, what, 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 what would they develop? And I just think it's that sort of interesting design challenge that you can get or that you can do in things like concept art or video games or film that might even come off as slightly kitschy for, a, for, for an architecture studio. But um, <coughs> anyway, that just, just an observation. Uh, to, to open this up to both of you, uh, uh, Jim, you and I spoke uh, the, the other week and, and posted a long interview on Building Blog that talked about uh, really kind of the architecture of the, of the, the, the bad guy. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was and how architecture can be used to sort of design an evil environment. And one of the things that you talked about was actually the Citadel from Half-Life 2. And I'm wondering if uh, maybe just in um, just a sort of a brief, almost Cliff's Notes, Cliff's Notes sort of guide to, to that, if you could just sort of give a... Uh, a recap of what, what you were saying about the Citadel and Half-Life 2 and the, the presence of this kind of alien architecture coming, coming to, uh, to represent evil and, 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 and what, what, what that means on a vocabulary level. Well, it, it was interesting in the way that it, it played out and it was more of a presence uh, initially than um, uh, w it wasn't necessarily clear. I, mean, I think the, the point I was making about the, the, the evil HQs was um, uh, you tend to, when, it, when it's a video game, you tend to know when it's evil because it's the, the giant citadel on, on the hill it's the place you're heading to to, to kill uh, uh, the bad guy, but um, it was sort of uh, un unclear, and it, was, uh, and it was ambivalent. It was sort of just alien infrastructure, um, and it wasn't clear that, that that's where you were necessarily going to head. I mean, I, I kind of wondered from, um, uh, from from Victor's perspective, actually, how much Valve uh, g gave you a sort of mandate of, of to, as to what you were building, you know, how threatening it had to be, wh whether they were trying to say you know, whether it was identifiably uh, the enemy, whether they gave you a kind of um, a, a free reign in, in, in designing that. Um, I'll give you a history of how these things happen. Usually, a little bit, just a bit of context. Everybody brings their um, favorite movie and book, and they build a chunk of everything. And then um, the elements um, just mix with each other, and there's no hierarchy. So my job was there to help them simplify everything and say, look, we're going to have this pretty realistic city that's going to be sober but very detailed. So what's the opposite of this? It has warm plaster. So let's do the simplest possible design, which is just a cube and a monolith with no detail, with nothing. And this, this feels like a real intrusion, just working by contrast. So this was my concept. Also, there were just very simple rules. The city was neoclassical sort of imitation of Western cities. Well, and th they're very symmetrical, the little houses and the parliament, everything about the combine design in the citadel was asymmetrical. Third, it's vertical. There was nothing round or horizontal about it, so it's just a pretty rough read. Vertical things feel pretty threatening, and uh, also I didn't want to make it solid at the base, so you don't know how it stands out. So there was very, very basic rules of minimalism and contrast that led to the design. Let's exclude everything that exists in this city and do totally the opposite. And there you have a design brief already, and it's very simple. And you just put a bunch of cubes together and rectangles and, and, and just remove color, and you have the alien design. Um, something else I thought was uh, interesting in your, in your presentation was uh, when you were talking about how to make a sci-fi version of Paris. Uh, you know, in this context, something like that comes off as being a very sort of science fictional uh, design process. You know, you take the the basic language of, of a Parisian, uh, you know, the mansard roof, the, the ground floor, and you take this kind of architectural language and you tweak it and you mutate it and you uh, get, get hit on the head with this screen <coughs> that I'm going to stand up to avoid. Uh, but um, wh what's interesting about that is that in this context, that's science fiction and that's sort of, a, that's how you design a video game or that's how you design uh, the cinema of the future. But that is, that at least at one point in architectural history, that was synonymous with architectural design. 
And so it's interesting then that if you were going to say the uh, Architectural Academy, if you were at, if the AA existed, in, and maybe it did, but if the AA existed in 1780, and you went and you learned the classical vocabulary, or you learned the Baroque vocabulary, or you learned a specific arch, uh, spe specific sort of a ornamental or, or detailed way of designing, and you tweak that and you mutate it in an almost a genetic or Dar Darwinian way, that was architectural progress at one point. But in this case, it's almost like uh, it almost takes on that yeah, like a sci-fi air where you're where you're you're deliberately sort of introducing mutation or introducing difference into into a vocabulary. Yeah. But. And that was just removing Renaissance and it goes, it goes to politics, like architecture very often, it's to urban planning. And if you think what the rules of building things are, you can really easily get science fiction. Because uh, until you know, the early 20th century, the rules in Paris were completely conservative and you can't change anything that defines the city. So this is very simple. It, urbanism is very important. A city like Istanbul, there were no rules, so every house is different. Well, if you start making them the opposite of this very uh, homogenous Istanbul, that would be science fiction. So it goes to, to politics, actually, and, and uh, to urbanism. Uh, I have one question. Uh, Jet and also the way he was, we were trying to build cities. Um, talking about the film, um, you were saying re reducing detail um, was important to the way you were, you were, you were constructing it. In video games, particularly, you talked talk about the, the Half-Life city being very detailed. Do you, do you think that the fact that um, video game design is very much tied to sort of technological progression and, and better rendering techniques and more details and, and horse traders, um, do you think that's damaging to, to, to the sort of the expression, the artistic expression? You should, you should compare this, you should take a 400 years of painting, um, like, and it's squish, squish, it, squish it into 10 years of video games or 20 years. What happened to painting is people relearned to paint in the Renaissance, and then they couldn't get a realistic image functioning. The perspective was off, the lighting was wrong, that's like video games. They started putting a lot of detail to make it more realistic. And it took work and it was difficult. So in video games, people just want to have to reach a level of detail that was enough. Before Half-Life and during this time, level uh, video games looked really empty. So we were looking for the right point of saturation when enough is enough. And actually, it's much less than you think. And it's talking, putting detail that matters, that's important. Detail that matters is antennas and things that silhouette in the air. Detail you put on the Maybe ground. Video games will get less detail now. I hope so. Any game I would work on, I'll drive to, to go beyond this stage and, and, and go to stylization now and remove detail and remove detail and go to but sobriety. Is it the case, um, sort of actually. The, the team the Fortress is an example. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's uh, team, team Fortress being a very cartoony game. It's a very, very Pixar look. But the actual technology is really high end, isn't it? It's not like. So they're going, oh, well, we've got that far, let's go back to these old stuff. But the, the creating that sort of impressionistic look, the actual sort of painterly visuals, that's an even higher kind of level of technology, isn't it? So it's almost like realism isn't the, the Well, exactly. The rich realism. I mean, romantic painters thought they rich realism, and their, their things look hor horribly cheesy because they render every leaf, every bug, every flower, every cherry. And it, it, you have this overwhelming amount of details, and, and video games could do this now, and it's time to move on and just just start reducing detail now. That's the challenge. Just And then eventually go to stylization, if you look what happened later, you know, I remember one impressionism, and just really play with the visual style. And that's that's the direction that I would try to, to do go if I had to uh, work on a future game. Um, well, I feel like there are about 100 different uh, ways that this conversation could go, but I think maybe for our time, uh, we're running, we'll just do one, one question and, and then wrap up and, and go to lunch where feel free to grab present presenters and pull them aside and, and ask, but let's do the question. Sorry, it's just relating to your uh, previous remark about the levels of detail that struck me with prodigies. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, it's when you're talking about the level of detail, it struck me with prodigies, prodigies when you remove the level of detailing of the, the background buildings that you're actually relying on the viewer then to apply the imagination of what, what has happened in this, in this future. And then also a slightly different thing happens with, from a viewer's perspective with the alternative Paris, the, the first one you showed us, that, that in the viewer is then expected to imagine what happened in the past to have created this alternative reality. And I was wondering if... Um, you've, you've talked about the decreasing level of detail as a kind of stylistic or, or, or an artistic advance, but um, from a viewer's perspective, um, you are putting a more emphasis on the viewer to imagine and, and what, what their alternative reality is, I think. And there's a two separate things here. Uh, when we look at things that we clearly see them, I believe, in 25-degree parameter, 
and the, to see the rest, we, we move our eye and we compensate. Uh, there's blind people that have missing one eye and they assume they see 180 degrees. There's even completely blind people that deny that they're blind, that they bump themselves into walls. These are clinical cases. So I think uh, still the, the, there's two things, what we built and the level of architecture that's in detail that's in the architecture and what we show. And about the prodigies was let's see how much, how, how little we can show and get away with it without people knowing something's wrong. And it's a test that hasn't been done because there's like the video game topic. People are on the let's put more detail competition. Well, I try to, let's, let's try to reverse. Let's see how little we can get away with and just uh, general compositions. So it's an exercise of not the design, but what you communicate about it and how much you show. I think you call that selective realism, isn't that what, what, yeah. what you refer to it as? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much to, to Victor and uh, for, for giving a, a, a really cool introduction to his work and, and uh, opening up a conversation that will hopefully continue on through the break, and to Jim for joining us up here in the, in the Q&A. And uh, yeah, so we're going to take a short break. I'd say maybe come back in about 15 minutes and 